So right now we'll be talking about uh, the uh, removal of uh, police from uh, the VIP security uh, by the uh, president of Nigeria, of course, uh, through the Minister uh, of State for Police Affairs, Iman Suleiman Ibrahim. All right, we have with us um, the former AIG Wilson Inalego from Sierra Leone. Thank you for being with us. Now, earlier we had a distortion and... The question I threw at you was, did this decision of the president uh, removing the, the police uh, security from the um, VIPs, did it come to you as a surprise? It's long overdue because if you look at it, Nigeria is currently facing daunting security challenges. And so, there is clearly police is understaffed and if we follow the current trajectory of deploying officers to private individuals even if you have one million police officers or personnel the challenges of his security will continue because uh, if you look at the un uh, ratio of one police officer to 400 and you have a situation where we are way under that because we have about 300 and something thousand officers. And this includes those that are not in general duty. But this includes doctors, uh, artisans, and other specialists. Therefore, the core officers you have to perform the uh, basic law enforcement duty, the number is greatly small. And so, if you have, for example, 10 police officers to one individual, if you multiply 400 to 10, that's about 4,000 people that should have been protected. And so the situation that we, that we currently have is such that the officers that are available for deployment to, for regular police duty becomes difficult. Imagine that you have a patrol vehicle position in a place, for example, in one of the districts in Abuja, and you have four personnel inside, and you have residents of that area amounted to two or three thousand, four thousand. Those four officers in that patrol vehicle are able to provide effective security for that neighborhood because they can respond rapidly, they can conduct patrols and make contact with the people. But where you have these officers, deployed to an individual and locked up in a house. And even the neighbors, when there is an outcry, they never get help. Therefore, in my opinion, the withdrawal of officers or police personnel from private individuals that are not entitled, for example, uh, the, 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 it is provided that you could ha you have the, the, the president, the vice president, the senate president, the deputy senate president, the speaker, and the deputy speaker, the governors of the states and their deputies, and the heads of security agencies, these are entitled. But a situation where you have everyone provided with security and those free to perform duty that will guarantee the safety of life and property are inadequate. You are going to have challenge. Now, uh, the, and the greatest tragedy to this is this. Go to some police divisions, uh, you will be alarmed that in a division that should have about 300 personnel, if you are lucky, you have 50. That means they are doing well. So, good morning. And so, the situation, the situation that you have, if you ask me, therefore, there is a need for a policy development regarding the security coverage of of go top government officials like governors do that i've mentioned because if you have this policy you are going to have a more structured approach but the situation where you have today you are going to continue to have difficulty with providing security for the ordinary citizen because you don't have that number and if it continues 
like I said in my opening remarks, if you if you have more million police officers, you are still going to have problem because everybody is going to request for two, they're going to request for 10, they're going to request for 20, they're going to request for 50, and all the rest of them. But we, we, we can make an exception that there are clearly people that may not be governors, may not be uh, 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 president or otherwise, but in the national interest, you could provide security for those top category of people. And I'm talking about very, very top entrepreneurs. But doesn't that I, and I give an example. Of the president? Exactly, exactly. I mean, we're going back on it. We saw the uh, spokesperson of the police for, uh, force, uh, Olumuiwa Dijobi, saying that it is not exactly how, uh, or, like, there was a misconception of what the inspector general said. And he made mention of the fact that they would still give some people who are legally and statutorily entitled to the police uh, escort. So it's like we're back to where we started. AIG, then if you, if you look at the fact that I, I like that you mentioned earlier uh, the issue of the four police officers who patrol certain areas and being able to provide security for the thousands of residents of that areas. But we have seen time and time again in situations, especially here in Abuja, where we see certain highbrow areas you know, that are occupied by um, high-level politicians, top government functionaries, who all have personal security uh, personnel, be it police officers, private security, or what have you, in their houses across the vicinity of that area. Now, is withdrawing these police officers so much so, you know, a solution to the problem than hiring more or, uh, police personnel, you know, to provide uh, more in terms of internal security to the people because we've seen situations where insecurity has increased exponentially over the course of the years. We've seen the Nigerian army taking up the responsibility of providing internal security to Nigerians as opposed you know, to the police, which is originally saddled with that responsibility. So is withdrawal alone enough? In dealing with the issues of security and law enforcement, You've got to adopt multi-dimensional approach. Clearly, the number of officers, when I'm talking of officers, I'm talking of every police personnel, just like the Police Act defines a police officer as any member of the Nigeria Police Force is an officer. So when I say officers, I'm referring to all police personnel, not just the, the top echelon. Now, the idea of freeing police from some of these people is to enable those that are not entitled. And indeed, there are many that are not entitled. You are not going to be able to recruit uh, 1,000 police officers today and deploy them on the street. And like I, if you, what I, I stated very clearly that if we continue in the current trajectory where almost everybody is applying for officers to be in their homes, you are not going to have problem. You are, you are going to have problem. Therefore, the first step, and I think it's a very important step, is to look who are those entitled statutorily. Then you provide for those. Then you again, because you are going to look at some people. For example, let me ask you a question. A, a person like Dangote, Dangote is not a minister. I mean, uh, it's not a governor. That would take is not a president. But you know that he is a big wig in the business community. And can you imagine what the image of Nigeria would look like if you hear that, oh, so, uh, God forbid, Tangute was traveling somewhere and has been kidnapped. If people are going to lose confidence in the economy, in the social political development. They'll say, if somebody like Tangute. So, when you are withdrawing, you are going to make very few exceptions, very, very few. But if you withdraw, you make them free, and you get to educate proper communication with these individuals. Look, you live in Metama, you live in uh, Wuse, you live in Utako, you live in uh, uh, whatever part of uh, Kubwa. If we have more officers on the street, you are freer, because those in your house, cannot give you that protection that you need. Those, those that you carry in your motorcade cannot stop you from being attacked. But what, 
what we try to do is this. If we have more officers on the street, if we can en uh, enable them with uh, patrol vehicles and other means of uh, uh, patrol, and uh, I mean equipment in terms of technology, you are going to guarantee more security. If you have 1,000 officers locked up in, in various uh, first property in Metama, they cannot provide security for, for that area. But if you have even 30 patrolling uh, Metama with communication, with vehicle, with connection with each other, with the control room, and people can uh, call the helplines and they respond, they are going to be in a better position to guarantee security for Metama. Because if they enter your house, sometimes they can even kill the officers who may not be very uh, vigilant. Therefore, in the interest of all, it is important that, number one, what are the numbers you have in government houses? Clearly, there are too many, too much. You've got to rationalize them. You go to the, 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 the all the places, and I'm happy if you look at the villa. Villa used to have a large number, but they've trimmed it because, look, what number do you need? Clearly, many state government houses have just too much. So in withdrawing, I think they have to do the personnel assessment in various government houses, bring them out and push them. Bring them from Abuja, bring them from Lagos, places, places that you have a place like Zamfara. Maybe you have 4,000 officers. You have 4,000. And you have a place like uh, uh, Rivers, you have about uh, 15,000. And there should be in terms of, of course, uh, crime and other indices, you've got to begin to measure. Therefore, the human resource unit of the Nigeria Police Force, as headed by the first secretary, should begin to look at the, the, the crime trends, the crime patterns, and begin to shift these officers to where they are needed. All right. And not what to I cluster let's them about, in some states. About, that, um, you know, what I asked earlier. I mean, you mentioned uh, the picture you painted earlier. It just shows um, what the developed country are doing already, where you can easily or quickly go about two miles and then you meet a police officer or you make a quick uh, call, SOS, and then they rush down to you like quickly and swiftly. Meanwhile, here, especially in the Northeast region where there has been a lot of security challenges, that has been the complaint where they say the bandits are closer to them than the security pole, which is, uh, you know, our security agent pole, and which is one of the most scary things. And right now, the, the, uh, the police force are coming out to say that the ban, it's not a ban of saying the police will not even uh, provide, will stop providing the VIP um, escort service. So the question is, should the police even be providing a VIP? In the first and place. In the first I place. Mean, I, mean, I mean, because there are, there are private so security outfits, AIG, that should be saddled with the responsibility of providing this VIP special protection services. So should, the police is already running a deficit of around 100,000 officers if you, you know, capture the benchmark you mentioned earlier. So are we supposed to be using the little of the police resources in terms of human personnel that we have you know, to protect individuals who alternative security arrangements could be prepared for? Well, but I think... The, the, this directive is a wake-up call. Now, what is the level of development of the private security? Ideally, ideally, some private security company, depending on their capacity, should be allowed to be a basic uh, side weapon, like pistol, for example. But in the midst of such uh, insurgency, in the midst of banditry, in the midst of Boko Haram, in the midst of the agitation in the, uh, in, the, in the Niger Delta and other across the country. You cannot at this stage begin to talk about arming private security. But there could be a transition. And in that transition, they begin to gradually withdraw this person. But like I said, the withdrawal, what is, is to prevent an abuse. Prevent an abuse where people are not clearly entitled. And I think that is what the first PRO was 
alluding to, personnel are going to be withdrawn, but they are going to look at the specific cases where clearly how, what is the assessment? Why is this individual providing security? You know, there are different categories. You could have a situation where somebody writes to the police, my life is under threat. I had an attack. I had all this. And for a limited period, for two weeks, for one month, such an individual can be provided. So when you have a ban, it cannot be uh, it, it cannot be a blanket uh, ban or withdrawal. But it is Nigeria should be right and prepared now to begin to look at the option of private security instead of using official security for some category of private individuals. But for governors, for presidents and vice, senior presidents and deputy and all those, those are statutorily provided. But for the other individuals, yes, it's time for them to begin to look at the other option, especially when it comes to guarding their companies, guarding their property and all of that. But at this stage of our developed uh, national life, we've got to do a gradual pull, but we've got to do a kind of personal audit. Like I try to say, even those who are entitled, some of them are clearly overprovided. Now, let me give you one scenario. The institution we have, in addition to having these private officers providing security for private individuals, even the ones that you have, when you deploy them on patrols, for example, when you deploy them for response, what do you have? To, what is the most force multiplier in terms of technology? Like, so a lot of people came in, in the last two, three years to begin to provide uh, something like a quick alert. Now, even if you're able to call the control room, what are the facilities they have for such rapid response? What vehicles do you have? How many police divisions have five or ten service vehicles? It's not possible to have... A police division of three hundred well, has three hundred personnel, having even ten service vehicles. So all these are the force multipliers. You really don't need. And if you look at FCT during the regime of uh, uh, Mal, uh, Dr. Ali Modibo, where he bought a lot of vehicles, you could have in every part of the FCT. And I think then within three to five minutes, you could have a response. So while you are considering withdrawing these officers, you have to think of the logistics to make it possible for the officers to patrol. All that you need, for example, is that having that police presence, that security presence. You don't, the situation that we have, it, it has, especially in FCT and other places, you are not supposed to have the military, the army or anybody they, it, they, because of the police primacy. But where the police is unable to respond, where the police that should have their units, like uh, like having uh, the, 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 the riot control unit, riot dispersal unit, being able to respond. Well, but where you have a situation, unfortunately, where you are not able to muster that number, then you begin to have situation. But I think if I am to address the news, is to look at this situation and study carefully. Why do we still have the military coming to help us at every incident? What can we do? What have we learned? What is What are the gaps? Because if you don't understand those gaps, you are going to continue to have them. And in some police commands, you have some commissioners of police who are able to optimize their human and material resources. And you are not going to have the military coming to intervene at any case, because the military has quite a lot to do in the Northeast and part of the uh, Northwest. But some of these are basic police functions that a, a well-equipped police force should be able to handle them. The situation that I find, like especially banditry in the Northwest, I don't see why the police is not able to deal with it. But yeah, G, isn't there so, sort of a double jeopardy somewhere? Because I mean, you mentioned earlier that you find situations where you go to a police division in some state, uh, where you're supposed to meet around 300 officers or personnel of the force. You're lucky if you get 50. You mentioned the issue of logistics where 
you know, the logistics or the amount of logistics available is not enough to cater for the workforce. Doesn't this put the um, NPF in sort of a precarious situation where it is forced to seek or, you know, seek external funding some way, somehow? Perhaps the reason why it has to seed out some of its personnel to these private individuals who are willing to pay for the services of these police officers? No, I, I don't think it is seeding. The, I, I, you see, what I think, the, Nigeria pub, the Nigerian public must understand that the issue of policing is a collective thing. It's collective responsibility. The police and the public. And it is not only about giving, giving information to the police. It's about holding government accountable. Oh, every time we are in a democracy, but we have more military boots on ground than we have police with backing on the street. It is about the people holding government accountable. The Inspector General of Police is an employee of the government, and there is a limit to which or what he can do. He is going to make those requests. But in making those requests, he's going to follow the normal process of the envelope system of budgeting in the National Assembly. And he's not able to be provided. So when we are talking about this job, double jeopardy, it is for us to come out of this quagmire of insecurity. It's for the public to rise up and say, look, I am the member representing uh, Maraba constituency. I visited the police station. I asked the DPO. I checked their personnel board because if you go to every police station at the counter, you are going to find the personnel strength, the establishment, and then the strength. And I found that it is my Maraba constituency. I have two police divisions there. What did I see? I saw that they are supposed to have 500, and I found only 50. Vehicles, they have only one. The other ones are on the stone. They are not moving. And in that case, the people begin to react. And then you begin to have a police force that is able. I think the Nigerian police force is very prepared and I believe very capable. But the situation that we have is so there that, that, that the police is just in, uh, making improvisation. And so... You've got to be smart to be able to be a police commissioner in DPO because you've got to think of optimizing your resources, mixing those, those human and material resources to begin to be able to police your area properly. But the Nigeria police force does not need any help from anybody, any agency. In fact, the problem that we have that is fueling insecurity is a multiplicity of security agencies. A situation where you have, you come you see this uniform, you don't know whether it's police, this is vigilante, this is uh, all that. When there was this terrible bank robbery at Otoko, the police and everybody was taken on our ways. These guys came, I assembled at a place, from what I had, and they all wore black, and they were just marching, and people thought there might be one vigilante or one group that came from somewhere. Until the attack started before they knew these guys were not police or any official security. So I believe this issue of vigilantism and all this put together is what is making insecurity intractable. Right. Believe me. Now, let me I I want to make a very a point very quickly. AIG quickly in 2020, in 2020, the former president uh, uh, Buhari made about 13 point something billion available for uh, the community policing initiative, uh, providing for the pressure constabulary. And what did that provide? That provided like, you could have somewhere in Nyanya, a neighborhood in Nyanya, and the LCD can say, okay, we are going to recruit 10 uh, people who are familiar with this community. And then they are given uniform but given a slight different mark to work under the police. And then these people who mix and mingle in those communities, they are wearing police uniforms. You have two regular officers with about 10. They are patrolling. The presence is 
They, they are under command and control. In that case, you have multiplied the number of personnel. But what we have, everybody is forming vigilante, vigilante, state governments are forming vigilante. That is what is causing the insecurity. But for withdrawal of officers, it is overdue. Thank you very much, AIG. Thank you so much for joining in. Uh, you spoke with so much passion, and we do hope that we bring you back again Indeed. to continue this conversation, yes. especially on the special constabulary. Thank you so much for coming on the program. Thank you. The pleasure.